The typical beginner's explanation of complex numbers has something to do with the square root of negative 1 being a 90 degree rotation in the 2D plane. And each complex number forms a vector in 2D space. Today I want to go beyond that, and here's how it will happen. Instead of starting from the complex numbers and going into the two-dimensional plane, we will explore properties of two-dimensional space, and then discover the properties of complex numbers. I hope this will provide a very fresh approach to the topic, so let's get right into it. Before we begin, there are some prerequisite concepts that will make this video much easier to follow. Some experience with complex numbers will certainly help, but I will also be making a lot of connections to linear algebra. Specifically, if you are familiar with treating matrices as transformations, and you've had experience with calculating dot products and determinants, you should be prepared for this video. If we want to form an algebraic system of two-dimensional numbers, it would probably be a good place to start by asking, how do we make two-dimensional numbers act like one-dimensional numbers? To use more specific vocabulary, we could say, how can we make a field of 2D numbers? There's a lot to know about fields that is outside of the scope of this video, but all you need to know for now is that, just like the one-dimensional numbers, you can add, subtract, multiply, divide, and invert them. Now, if you look at the one-dimensional number line, you will see that there is this inherent symmetry around the origin. This reflection can be performed by multiplying a number by negative 1. We can multiply by negative 1 multiple times, and we will reflect back and forth across the origin. If we use addition, say we keep adding 1, we do not have this property. So in the algebra of one-dimensional numbers, we have this connection between multiplication and symmetry, and this fact will be very useful to us to determine how two-dimensional algebras will work. So in one dimension, your identity element is just the number 1, but in two dimensions, it's the identity matrix, and its column vectors form a basis that looks like a tessellation of squares. So if our unit element in two dimensions is a square, and you can form the definition of multiplication through symmetries, then perhaps the symmetries of a square can be connected to the algebras in two dimensions. Specifically for a square, there are four rotational symmetries and four reflection symmetries. For the reflection symmetries, you can reflect across the diagonals or the horizontal and vertical axis. For the rotational symmetries, you can rotate 180 degrees clockwise or counterclockwise, and you could also rotate 90 degrees counterclockwise and clockwise. If you perform these same symmetries on the basis 1, 0, 0, 1, then you can get the matrices that correspond to these symmetries. For the 180 degree turn, you just take the negative of your identity matrix. In order to reflect across the vertical axis, you just multiply the first basis vector by negative 1. And for the horizontal axis, you just switch the position of the negative sign. To reflect along the diagonals, you need to put the ones on the anti-diagonal of the matrix, and again multiply by negative 1 to get the other diagonal. For your 90 degree rotation counterclockwise, you use the matrix 0, negative 1, 1, 0. And to go the other direction, you switch the position of the negative sign. So now we have quantified every single symmetry of a square using a 2x2 two two matrix. This group of symmetries is called the dihedral group of the square, and the matrices are the matrix representation of this group. Now, I want you all to see what happens when we square all of these matrices. For all the reflection matrices, you end up back at the identity matrix when you multiply it with itself. And this should make sense. In matrix multiplication, you could interpret that squaring as doing a transformation twice. You're doing something twice. And if you take a square and you reflect it twice, you're going to end up in your original position. However, for the 90 degree rotation matrix, if you square this one, you end up at the negative identity. This should make sense because if we compose two 90 degree rotations, we end up with a 180 degree turn. So out of all of the symmetries of a square, you have one unique symmetry that stands out from the rest, which is this 90 degree rotation. If you square it, you end up with a negative identity, instead of the original identity matrix. So in the context of linear algebra, 
the idea of square rooting negative 1 comes out more naturally. Now remember how you can form linear combinations of vectors in order to get the span of those vectors? You can do the same thing with these matrices, where we use a point in 2D space as the coefficients. Each of these spans here can form their own algebras, but for reasons outside of the scope of this video, the matrices formed using the reflection symmetries do not form fields. However, our 90 degree rotation matrix does give us a field, hence, we have objects in the 2D plane that behave like one-dimensional numbers. When you multiply two of these matrices together, you end up with a new point, which is in complete agreement with the system of complex numbers. In fact, these matrices are the complex numbers, just in an expanded form. I skipped over many rigorous details in establishing that complex numbers are a field, but for now, the main idea I want to get across is that complex numbers are a sub-algebra of 2x2 matrices. But unlike 2x2 matrices, complex numbers have all the properties of one-dimensional numbers. However, that is not all there is to say about the connections between linear algebra and complex numbers. For this next section, we are going to talk about ideas that don't seem to be related to complex numbers, but I promise they will come back. For now, let's shift over to quadratic forms. If you are wondering what I mean by quadratic form, I bet most of you are already familiar with one. It's called the Pythagorean Theorem. Traditionally, Pythagorean Theorem is a formula for calculating the length of a hypotenuse. However, there is another way to interpret the expression. The theorem also tells us that we can take a two-dimensional vector and calculate its square. Calculating the square in one dimension is easy, just multiply a number with itself. To multiply a vector with itself, you must use Pythagorean Theorem. Here is that multiplying process in terms of the components a and b. And if a and b form a vector x, then we can say x times itself is equal to its square. And the key takeaway of this section is that a quadratic form establishes a relationship between vectors and areas, an idea we will return to multiple times. This vector squaring process can be expressed as a matrix multiplication. If we take a row vector, which is the transpose, and multiply it with its corresponding column vector, you can replicate Pythagorean theorem. From now on, I will use this x transpose x notation to express the square of a vector. Now I want you to see what happens when we take the legs of this right triangle and treat those as vectors. Let's call these vectors x and y, and they have the components ab and cd. The vector that sits on the hypotenuse is the sum of x and y. If you eyeball it, these vectors look like they are 3, 0, and 2, 0. You can use these numbers to clarify what I'm about to say, but this works for any two vectors at a right angle. From what we know about Pythagorean Theorem, we can deduce that the square of this hypotenuse is a squared plus b squared plus c squared plus d squared. If we rewrite this in vector form, we get x squared plus y squared is equal to x plus y squared. You can say that this is a vector version of Pythagorean Theorem, but instead of squaring lengths, you are squaring vectors. But that's just for the case where the vectors are at right angles. What if we shrunk the angle? The new square of x plus y would shrink, so we would have to subtract off some area to find its square. If you pull the vectors apart, the square of x plus y would grow, so you would need to add some extra area. To find out what this extra area is, all you need is the distributive property. If your vectors are not at right angles, then there is this new term that falls out, in the form of 2x transpose y. In terms of the components, this is 2 times ac plus bd. So now, not only can we square vectors, we can also multiply two vectors together and express another area. If we squeeze these vectors back together in a right angle, there is no extra area, so the product of the vectors x and y goes to zero. This is called the dot product between two vectors. It's zero at right angles and grows along with the angle. In other words, the dot product measures how close together two vectors are. There is a reason I have been expressing all of these ideas through matrix multiplication. We can actually slip an identity matrix between these vectors without changing the meaning of the expressions. But now, we have a means of generalizing the dot product, 
What if we replaced this identity matrix with different 2x2 two two matrices, such as the matrices of the dihedral group we looked at earlier? Let's see what happens. We'll start off with the familiar case. When you put an identity matrix between a row and column vector, you get the expression AC plus BD, which becomes zero when the vectors are at right angles. From our horizontal and vertical reflection matrix, we get the expression minus AC plus BD. This expression becomes zero when the two vectors are reflected along a diagonal. When we use the diagonal reflection matrix, we get the expression AD plus BC which becomes zero when the two vectors are reflected along the horizontal or vertical axis. Last, but definitely not least, if we use our 90 degree rotation matrix, we get minus AD plus BC, which becomes zero when the vectors are parallel to one another. Here is a summary of all the quadratic forms that can be created using these matrices. Notice how the two reflection matrices have a trade-off relationship. As one quadratic form approaches zero, the other moves away from zero. Because you can't have both diagonal and horizontal vertical symmetry at the same time. There is a similar relationship between the two rotation matrices. When the vectors become more parallel, the expression on the left grows. And as they become more perpendicular, it shrinks. The expression on the right side is the opposite. When the vectors become more perpendicular, it grows and as the vectors become more parallel, it shrinks. Now we have two dot products, and their values trade off with each other. And in the same way the original dot product corresponds to an area, this new expression also corresponds to an area, which is the area of the parallelogram formed by the vectors. This new area is the determinant of a matrix, where the column vectors are the sides of the parallelogram. So now we know that the determinant is actually a generalized dot product. Earlier we mentioned that if the vectors are parallel to one another, this expression goes to zero. And now that is much easier to see. If the vectors are parallel, the parallelogram disappears, so the area is zero. We now have the system where we can get values that trade off with one another as we adjust an angle. I hope this reminds you of the way trigonometry behaves. In fact, the dot product is proportional to cosine, and the determinant is proportional to sine. You can convince yourself of this as an exercise. In summary, we have several different ways of describing the horizontal relationship and vertical relationship between two vectors. We have the identity matrix, which acts as a real part, and the rotation matrix that acts as an imaginary part. These matrices are the identity and 90 degree rotation. Their quadratic forms are the dot product and the determinant, which are proportional to cosine and sine. One grows when the vectors are parallel, the other grows as they become perpendicular. With all this in mind, I can finally address why complex numbers are such an amazing set of numbers. Here I have a normal complex multiplication. If we convert these numbers, which are actually the vectors a, b, and c, d, into their respective matrix forms, we can replicate this multiplication as such. The real part of this product, ac minus bd, is a quadratic form that can be expanded to expose how horizontally symmetric the two vectors are, and the imaginary part, ad plus bc, can be expanded to tell us how diagonally symmetric the vectors are. Now look at what happens if you put a negative sign in front of di. This is called taking the complex conjugate of a number. The real and imaginary parts of this product are the dot product and determinant of the two vectors. Here is the expanded matrix form to show that these matrices do in fact hide inside the product. This is a demonstration of how easy it is to retrieve information about symmetries only by complex multiplication. Multiplying by the conjugate is especially important because the determinant, or the vertical relationship, stays on the imaginary part, while horizontal relationships stay on the real part. This means that drawing the imaginary axis as the vertical axis is not arbitrary. As long as we draw our real number lines horizontally, the imaginary numbers are inherently tied to the vertical direction. I hope this video sparked your imagination in finding relationships between geometry, linear algebra, group theory, trigonometry, complex analysis, and more. Speaking of more, there is one more section that 
Although I couldn't find a place to fit it in the video, it would be too much of a shame to leave out. If you square vectors using different dihedral matrices, and you constrain those expressions to a constant value, then all the vectors that fit this constraint will draw out the conics. For the identity matrix, you get a circle. For the horizontal and vertical reflections, you get hyperbolas. For the diagonal reflections, you get the rational functions. And all of these curves are tangent to the circle. The only exception is the 90 degree rotation, which is always zero, so it cannot be set to a constant value. There are many more ideas I tried to fit in this video, but for the sake of brevity, I will put them all here in the form of queries that you can go explore yourself.